Charlie, you probably don't remember me. My name is Susan Penny, and I was thinking about you as far as giving a speech for money uh, to a group of physicians and lawyers that would be a luncheon speech. I was talking to Jack McGlynn and to Jim Ritchie about the, how you would do in this crowd, and they thought you would be absolutely phenomenal. CMCE1 allows the body to produce communicase E1, an enzyme which activates the messenger neuropeptides that travel between the auditory cortex, where the symbols of spoken language are processed, and the hippocampus, where symbolic information interfaces with the emotions. While we're eating our lunch, we're going to have the enjoyment of our lunch and speaker. Our speaker has been a pioneer in the fields of both genetics and human communication. He has served as an advisor to the United States Surgeon General on Heredity and Bioengineering, a member of President Clinton's Task Force on Aging, and a consultant to the Human Genome Project. He has taught at Dartmouth College, Columbia University, and is currently a research fellow at Johns Hopkins University. His forthcoming book, Genome Out of the Bottle, explores how genetic science will reshape our lives. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alvin Apker. Thank you very much. I notice by reading the program for this seminar that I am the only speaker with the letters PhD after his name. And I hope that does not create unrealistic expectations. When Susan Penny asked me whether I'd give this talk, I was reluctant. But Susan is a very persuasive woman. It's actually interesting how uh, Susan and I came to know each other. It was at a party celebrating the acquittal of an old college friend of mine. <laughs> it was a medical malpractice case, and Susan had done a phenomenal job of defending him. So I know that if I say anything today that rankles you or disturbs you or even something I say that you might find actionable, I know that I can always call on Susan to defend me. As I already pointed out, I am not an MD, but later on in this talk, I am going to presume to make a diagnosis of all of you. I was speaking last week with Craig Venter of the Human Genome Project. I happened to mention that I was going to be giving this speech on communication to this audience. And he said, you're not going to tell them the truth, are you? I don't know how much of the truth I am going to tell you today. I will tell you that part of the truth that I think that you can handle. <laughs> There are two cardinal sins from which all the others spring, impatience and laziness. Let's think about that for a moment in the context of human communication. First, who said those words? 
I'll give you a hint, I'll narrow it down. There are two cardinal sins from which all the others spring. I like to take a poll when I, uh, when I show this slide. How many of you think that Abraham Lincoln said those words? Okay. How many of you think that the Buddha said those words? Okay. Franz Kafka? Dick Cheney. Okay. I promise I'll give you the answer at the end of the talk. Impatience and laziness. According to Lincoln, Buddha, Kafka, or Dick Cheney, your communication problem is either that you are impatient or that you are lazy. So take a moment and mentally make a decision about which your primary communication weakness is. Are you impatient or are you lazy? Joseph Pierce and Harrison Rogers, social psychologists at MIT. Between 1993 and 1995, they conduct a series of studies. They were trying to understand how highly educated people communicate and whether their style of oral communication differs measurably from that of the general public. The way they set up the experiment was this. They began with doctors, 122 physicians in the Boston metropolitan area. And what Pierce and Rogers did was they sent people to cocktail parties where they would strike up conversations with physicians. These conversations were recorded with hidden recording devices. And at the same time, Pearson Rogers did the same thing with a control group of 122 subjects whose highest level of education was four years of college. All of the conversations were transcribed, and here is what they found. We begin with a statistic that's called the ROI. This is the rate of interruption. You recognize this statistic. This is the number of times in a 10-minute interval that the person speaking interrupts the person that they are speaking to. The control group interrupted on an average 6.3 times for every 10 minutes, the physicians 18.1 times. The next Pierce Rogers statistic is similar. This is the rate of self-interruption, the number of times in a 10-minute interval that the speaker interrupts himself or herself changing thought in mid-sentence. Again, there's quite a disparity. The control group interrupted on average 0.6 times per 10 minutes. The physicians 12 times per 10 minutes. Another statistic is the interrogative response interval, simply the length of time you wait to answer a question after you've been asked the question. That is assuming you have not already interrupted the person you're <laughs> talking to. And here, uh, Pierce Rogers found that the control group waited 0.9 seconds before answering the physicians, just 0.3 seconds. And now we come to, I think, the most interesting of Pierce Rogers' statistics. This is language pattern repetition. Linguists have found, and this is across cultures, linguists have found that what we do in conversation is we repeat each other. We repeat words phrases, even the rhythms of the person we are speaking to. This happens at an unconscious level. And it seems to signal to the person that we are talking to that we are listening. So for this statistic, what the computer does is language analysis from the transcripts. Here we find that the control group repeats words and phrases of the person they're speaking to at a rate of 21.4%, physicians just 6.7%. I think you know where, where all of this is going. Okay. Now, the following year, Pearson Rogers did a follow-up study, Pierce Rogers II, this time not with physicians, but with attorneys and judges. And it found pretty much the same thing. Now, the two Pierce Rogers studies have been faulted because there was no human subjects protocol. No one told the doctors and lawyers that they were being recorded. But still, within the field, these two studies do command general agreement 
and they fit with what most people already know, doctors, lawyers, and other highly educated professionals are hard to talk to. So much research does seem devoted to proving the obvious. Allow me a personal story. When I was 22 years old, I spent three months at a Buddhist monastery in Thailand. And when I was coming back to the United States, I went through customs at John F. Kennedy International Airport. The customs inspector saw my shaved head. He said, oh, you're in the Marines. My son is a Marine. And he waved me through, did not ask me to open my suitcase, which was a good thing. <laughs> because inside my suitcase, inside my cotton laundry bag, and with all the dirty socks and t-shirts and underwear, there was a ceramic statue of the Buddha. It was about this big, terracotta. And inside that statue of the Buddha, right in the hollow center of the enlightened one, 100 grams of opium. It was a foolish choice. And as it turned out, I never got to try that opium. I had a girlfriend at the time. She was a very ethical woman. You might say compulsively ethical. She flushed the opium down the toilet. And then she broke up with me. She broke up with me, she said, not because I had opium in my possession. She broke up with me, she said, because when she flushed the opium down the toilet, I showed no emotional reaction. She said it was impossible to communicate with me. Last fall, an interesting thing happened. She found me on the internet. We'd been out of touch for 25 years. And so the next time that I happened to find myself in her city, we got together for dinner. And the first thing that she asked me was, had I forgiven her for flushing it down the toilet? I said that I hadn't really thought about it. She kept after me. Had it bothered me at the time? Did I think about it in the intervening years? Did I harbor any resentments? She grew progressively more agitated until finally she walked out of the restaurant, leaving me to finish her veal. <laughs> that was September of last year. I did not know then that by January of this year, I would understand the science of what happened in that restaurant. When I was an undergraduate in college, there was a group of four or five of us who worked in the chemistry lab with a professor who was trying to isolate isoquinoline. He was on an NSI grant, his money was running out, and that gave us a deadline. We worked constantly. We worked nights, we worked weekends. And I remember this, and I can say this honestly, I remember this as the happiest time of my life. I remember getting out of my last class on Friday around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, going right to the chemistry lab, working straight through Friday, Friday night, Saturday, maybe grab an hour of sleep Saturday night, go back to the chem lab, work straight through till about 3 in the afternoon on Sunday, when all of us would head over to the professor's house, and he would make these mountainous fruit salads, these beautiful omelets. Professor Wilson also introduced me to meditation, which is what led me to Thailand and that foolishness with the opium. Now just to, uh, as a footnote, to wrap up the story about the statue of the Buddha. After my girlfriend dispatched its contents, I put the statue on a shelf in my room. One day my father came into the room. I didn't notice him. I was reading Les Miserables. It was the passage where Inspector Javert throws himself into the Seine. My eyes were filled with tears. Then there was a crash. I looked up. 
I saw my father. He had taken the Buddha statue and smashed it on the floor. To me, it was just a souvenir. To my father, an Orthodox Jew, it was an idol. I recently had occasion to tell that story to a woman I was dating. She found it strange that I could remember the precise passage in Les Miserables that I was reading, but that I could not remember a word of what my father said when he smashed the Buddha. I cannot tell you what my father said when he smashed the Buddha. I cannot tell you what my girlfriend said when she flushed the opium down the toilet. I cannot remember what my first wife said when she announced that she wanted a divorce. It must be that I'm impatient or lazy, a bad listener. I am, after all, a highly educated professional, and Pierce Rogers tells us that highly educated professionals are lousy listeners. The Human Genome Project, on which I was a consultant, was sequencing the human genome, and they got to the 15th chromosome. Now, if you go down the 15th chromosome, you find a very interesting gene, LMT. It's the gene that governs production of the enzyme limitase. Now, some of you may know limitase by its old name, CLF, the cognitive limiting factor. This is the enzyme that basically tells the brain it's processed as much intellectual information as it can. It's time to take a break. In prehistoric terms, this probably meant, you know, go out and hunt an antelope. Those of you in higher education, when you see a student sleeping in the middle of a lecture, it may not be that they're tired. It may simply be that their brain is secreting limitase. Now, LMT, the gene for limitase, was not what surprised me. LMT had been mapped back in 1994, and I had been a member of the team that reviewed that research. In fact, I had speculated at the time that some people may lack the ability to synthesize the enzyme limitase. That is, their brains just keep going. And that if you lack the enzyme limitase, if your body does not synthesize it, perhaps that might correlate with academic success. That is, you can stay up all night studying, working in the chem lab, doing 18 hours of rounds as a medical intern, or in the case of lawyers, bill for more than 24 hours in a given day. <laughs> what surprised me was what I saw right next to limitase on the 15th chromosome. In the intervening period, another gene had been mapped. Here is a sequence map of chromosome 15. Here you see limitase. Right below it, you see the enzyme, let me move this up, the enzyme communicase E1, CMCE1, which uh, is the gene for the enzyme communicase E1. Genetic research is now unfolding so rapidly that it is literally impossible to keep up with it all. I had missed the mapping of this new gene, CMCE1. So I looked it up on the internet, and this is what I found. Communicase is actually a family of enzymes that play some role in how the brain processes symbols. You remember that all language is nothing more than symbols, be it written language or spoken language or gesture language, what we call sign language. Now, D.W. Chang right here at Cal Berkeley believes there are at least 20 different communicase enzymes, and possibly as many as 70. Some of these enzymes seem to affect the parts of the cortex that deal with visual stimuli, some with the parts of the cortex that deal with auditory stimuli, and some with both. But what happens when the brain 
is asked to process information that is simultaneously symbolic and emotional. That is where the gene CMCE1 comes in. CMCE1 allows the body to produce communicase E1, an enzyme which activates the messenger neuropeptides that travel between the auditory cortex, where the symbols of spoken language are processed, and the hippocampus, where symbolic information interfaces with the emotions. How could you not feel anything when I flushed the opium down the toilet? What if I could not feel anything because my body does not produce the enzyme that would allow me to feel anything? What if I am homozygous recessive for the enzyme communicase E1? But if that's the case, if I am genetically unable to handle emotional content, how is it that I can read Les Miserables and weep? Because that is reading. It's not auditory. And as if one eureka moment were not enough, I soon grasped something even more startling. Let's take a closer look at the 15th chromosome. You see the, uh, the uh, gene LMT and CMCE1. They're right next to each other. Is it possible that these two genes are linked, passed on as a unit, the same way, for instance, that ABO blood type and nail patella syndrome are passed on as a unit? This chart represents one of the 64 families that I studied last fall. And it's a, it's a good family to look at because there are six children. It's a large family. I took DNA samples from all eight individuals in this family. The uh, mother and father are now in their 70s, and these six children, all adults, who now range in age from 35 to 48. The uh, circles represent women, and the squares represent men. Okay, we'll begin with individual two, the mother. This woman holds a PhD in education. She interrupted her career to have children, but when she resumed her career, she became quite well known in her field. Okay, this uh, first son, individual one in the second level, is a patent attorney in New York City. Individual three, uh, she's a chief of obstetrics at a hospital in Virginia. Individual five, uh, astrophysicist with a jet propulsion laboratory. Individual number six is a public interest attorney in Washington, D.C. Now, why are there so many highly educated professionals in this one family? Is it nurture? Is it culture? Let's see what the genes say. The dark circles, dark squares, the individuals I just mentioned are all homozygous recessive for the non-functional enzyme alleles. That is, their bodies do not produce the limitase that tells their brain to stop taking information that's intellectual in nature, nor do they produce the communicase E1 that allows them to pay attention to emotional content. Let's look at the other three individuals. Individual number one in the first row, that's the father, the hollow square. These three individuals, the hollow squares, are all normal for these two traits. This is the father. He ran an import-export business, recently retired, high school education. Individual two, this hollow circle. This daughter has a BA, does human resources for a small shipping firm. Individual four, this daughter never finished college and has her own computer graphics business. So what does all this mean? It's hard to compress so much technical information into a short talk. But I would venture to estimate that if we were to do DNA samples for everyone here in this room, 70 to 80% of you would come up as 
dark circles or dark squares. So why are we like this? What adaptive function could these traits have played? It's always risky to speculate about the origin of genetic traits. But I think, I think we would do well to look at one clue. In 1922, an anthropologist named Edgar Fallentine traveled to Central Africa. And he studied a people called the Indimbi. And Fallentine became very interested that the Indimbi have a special group of individuals that they call Belembuer. Now, Belem is the Indimbi word that means mind. Buer, a suffix that means double. Let me just read you a brief passage from Fallentine's ethnography. The Ndimbi had experienced a cattle raid, and a meeting was convoked. The headman took no decision himself as to reprisal, but referred the problem to the Belembuer. These five persons deliberated from early afternoon until the following morning. Their discussions encompassed history, strategy, and were of a complexity that reminded one of a colloquy among chess masters. Valentin goes on to add that the Bellum Buer are also the subject of a certain amount of joking. There's one in Dimby saying, Bellum Buer Wibri to Galat, which can be translated as double mind but only half a heart. <laughs> I love this. Incidentally, in Valentin's account of the five Bellum Buer, one was a woman and all were polygamous. Let's now put this in the context of the United States 2001, where we're all supposed to listen to people talk about their feelings. I collect workshop titles, listening for lawyers, emotional intelligence for physicians, the book Emotional Intelligence, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's by a man named Daniel Goleman, a man with a non-technical education, who has presumed to tell us that we should feel like idiots because we don't hear other people's pain. Well, Mr. Goleman, I have news for you. I'm not supposed to. I'm genetically not supposed to hear other people's pain. You think of all the resources that you and your institutions are putting into communications workshops, and you know, it's not in your genes. If you've got patients who are coming into your office crying about their disease, or relatives who are unhappy about surgery that proved to be unnecessary, tell them to put it in an email. Instead of feeling like we're lazy or impatient, would it not be more profitable for us to investigate and identify the societal and interpersonal roles that are fitting for people of our genetic disposition? I have three wives. No, I'm not married to all of them, but Suzanne, and Dolores and Lisa all know about each other. They all consider me their husband. And they know that if I were to bring home 100 grams of opium and they don't like it, don't talk to me about it. I put up a big dry erase board in the kitchen. Leave me a note! <laughs> Friends. Friends, colleagues, I hereby give you permission to be who you are. Mutants on the 15th chromosome. <laughs> Belembuer, people of the double mind. Dazzling critical thinkers. 
yet oh so trusting when listening to a speaker over lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you believed it all the way through? Unfortunately, yes. Seem to have the ring of truth about uh, being impatient, interrupting people, not being a good listener. The most interesting thing for me was uh, learning that there is actually a reason for my um, communication problems. What was the most interesting part of the talk for you? The polygamy. The most interesting part? Uh, the opium. <laughs> the actual genetic stuff very compelling. I mean, because I know so little about it, I was very sucked in. He's too good a speaker to be a scientist. <laughs> too, too good a communicator. I, I, was, I was gullible for quite a while there. But I particularly, I particularly like the polygamy stuff. That was kind of a good tip off. Charlie, Susan Penny, I just have to tell you uh, what a success your show was. And just like you said, people were talking about it the next day and you know, they, it, they were, it was just, I'm so happy about the way it turned out. I hope you are too.